Great. So I'm delighted to be joining you um, and to be able to share the work that I'm doing with colleagues uh, around the world uh, on telemedicine. Uh, this particular presentation is work I'm doing in conjunction with Dr. George Velez and Dr. Irma Molina Vicente, who are part of the VA Caribbean Health System, and with Dr. Mitchell Eisenwer, who is here uh, also as a co-presenter. Uh, he is uh, with the IBMC, our hospital here, Beckley Square Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts, and Zoe Liao, who is our research assistant on this project. So um, let me begin by just saying um, how important this topic is more than ever, given the challenges that our whole world has seen with the pandemic. Uh, and I think the lessons that we're learning now, uh, hopefully will be able to be sustained and grown over time. Uh, as we try to develop uh, better ways to deliver healthcare. Uh, we have been active in this area for many decades. Our division of clinical informatics was founded 50 years ago and was one of the first divisions in the world to be able to do uh, uh, technology for improving healthcare. We developed some of the very first uh, telehealth uh, systems connecting doctors um, and patients and uh, parents also to uh, to their children who are, may have been in the neonatal intensive care units. And so there was a project here at Beth Israel uh, in the late uh, 1980s and uh, 90s called Baby Care Link that allowed parents to be able to see their baby in the neonatal intensive care unit. And that was led by Charlie Safran. And Dr. Charles Safran was the previous division chief. Um, and I'm delighted to be part of this division, continuing that legacy of trying to provide high-touch health care that improves outcomes, but also improves quality of life, not just for the patients, but their families. And on that topic, then I'd like to sort of uh, go into this uh, area of family-based and family-centric telehealth. Um, the system I'm going to be presenting to you is called InfoSage. It was developed by funding from the Agency of uh, Healthcare Research and Quality, Quality here in the United States, AHRQ. Uh, there may be some products that we'll mention on the slide, but they're uh, for illustrative purposes and there is no commercial relation between uh, these vendors. Uh, the work that we are doing with the Veterans uh, Administration is supported by grants from the VA Office of Rural Health and Resources, um, and, um, but they do not what we're presenting here do not represent the views uh, of um, the uh, Veterans Administration. Um, and this is uh, the contents do not represent the use of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs of the United States government. Um, all right, so uh, what are some healthcare challenges that we think are important that telehealth can particularly address? I think one of them uh, for sure is that um, if we have an aging population worldwide, people are living longer. Uh, and as we live longer, we uh, have more and more medical conditions to deal with. And this, as you can see here, the percentage of people over 60 is growing everywhere. And as uh, the challenges of malnutrition get resolved in parts of, uh, of the world, those uh, populations also have an aging population. And with that comes a rise of chronic diseases. Uh, and typically, most people have more than more, uh, chronic diseases, usually two or three. And so as people start to live with multiple chronic conditions, they have different providers and it makes it difficult sometimes for them to actually physically to go to all their medical appointments. So telehealth is definitely something that needs to be looked at uh, for being able to address these needs. We also see that there's rising healthcare costs. And one of the areas where this is also being seen is uh, with conditions that are related to Alzheimer's and dementia, which in the United States alone is costing over uh, 290 billion uh, dollars. So clearly our healthcare spending is outstripping uh, our GDP growth. And so we need to find more efficient ways to be able to deliver care to more people more efficiently. Uh, and we also have to recognize that we have a limited number of healthcare professionals. And this is even more true in the ger geriatric space where there's a, a real shortage of professionals in that space. And so how do we care for a growing aging population 
with a very limited supply of healthcare professionals. So we need to find ways to engage others. Uh, and one of the areas is to see whether we can engage with families uh, who are already uh, involved in some of the care of their family members. It's estimated that family caregivers provide about 18.5 billion hours of care here in the United States. Two thirds of those are uh, often women. And sometimes the care that they give is so much that they themselves uh, have health issues and start to have burnout. So we need to find a way of how do we uh, support that older adult and not have all of that fall on one particular person. And so we have to recognize that healthcare right now is very fragmented. We see all kinds of um, uh, different service providers. Uh, so you may have multiple doctors, multiple specialists. You may be going to more than one pharmacy. You may be buying things online. You may have home visiting health aid nurses. And then there's your family that's also involved in the care. And so how do we coordinate all of this care and how do we provide a way to help um, uh, people age the way they'd like to? Most people don't really want to age in a hospital or a high intensive nursing home. They wanna be able to age at home. And so the question is how do we provide better tools for aging in place so that we can monitor and support patients at home uh, without having them to physically come in to the office. And so we started this idea of, could we use technology to support older adults and their families? And clearly the internet and mobile phones have dramatically increased in terms of ownership. This is the growth chart here in the United States. Um, and while not everyone has an internet uh, or, or internet connection or a smartphone, uh, a large number of them uh, do. So the question is, what can we do to help these families um, use that technology to coordinate the care? If we look at one of the studies from the Pew uh, Research Center here in the United States uh, from 2019, you see that there's a high percentage of ownership of uh, cell phones. But the number of smartphones drops about half by the time you're 65. And if we go beyond 65, the actual usage of those phones starts to drop. And so while it's clear that more and more people have them, it's not clear that these are actually being used effectively for telehealth uh, at home with older adults. And so that gave rise to our research study, which started eight years ago. And can we use technology uh, for supporting families caring for older adults at home. Uh, and so we began this work um, with having focus groups with their families to understand what are the challenges that they have in terms of caring for those family members. One of the things that they said was very prominent is that care coordination was exceptionally challenging, that uh, being able to communicate what's the status of that patient what needs to be done next, who's responsible for doing that. And if it's only one person, then there's no coordination to be done. But typically, this is not a really sustainable way to, to care for an adult as they have greater and greater needs. And so how do we get more people involved, communicate, uh, and coordinate that work? We also talk to the older adults uh, and in terms of their needs and preferences. And one of the things that they said clearly is that they were willing to trust certain family members with uh, most, if not all, of their information, but they did want to have control over who had access to that information. And so we started working towards how do we build a flexible system that allows you to do care coordination and to be able to uh, allow those that, that older adults to control that network and designate how they want to be able to use that. So that gave rise to InfoSage, and InfoSage um, is, was built uh, with AHRQ funding from the U.S. government. Uh, it's a not-for-profit research platform. It's openly available for anyone to use. So you can go to that website, infosagehealth.org, and sign up and, and try it out. It allows you to create a private uh, social network uh, where you can choose who's a, a member of that network. And then the, uh, the patient at the center of the network gets to decide who's in their network and what permissions and roles they have. Uh, in the platform, it gives you tools for medication management. Uh, and so you can have a bunch of medications. Uh, you can set when you're supposed to take them. The 
It sends you reminders of when you need to take them. There are uh, reminders uh, of that. There's also a uh, uh, drug-drug interaction alert. So we can connect to a database in the United States called RxNorm, and uh, it gives you drug information. And if you give it a list of drugs, it gives you potential drug-drug interactions. So we display that information to allow them to have a better idea of what potential adverse uh, uh, effects they may have from the combination of drugs they're taking. It also has some educational resources and links to the community where you can get help for different uh, health um, um, needs. And it has a task management list where uh, the family can create a list of things that need to be done and people within the network can sign up to do those tasks. This could be involved maybe taking the older adult to uh, 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 hospital visits, uh, or it could be um, helping them with their rehab, uh, or who's going to spend uh, the weekend or, or holidays with a particular family member. It also has communication tools, so you can have a group chat uh, within the, that community that's part of that private network. And while we had designed this for older adults, um, it can be used for any, uh, any patient uh, of any age with any condition. And so uh, we're now looking at expanding the application of this to other types of families. Here it gives you a, an overview of how the permissions work. The keystone is the patient, it's the older adult, who has control of everything within the network. Uh, as you become older, you might not be able to uh, manage all of these tasks, so you can designate someone to be your proxy. That proxy person can help uh, invite people to the network, uh, and help enter medications um, and do all, all the things that the older adults or the Keystone uh, patient can do. You can also have people designated as caregivers, and so they can um, view the medication. They can't add them, but they can view, and they can help, for example, with uh, reminders um, for when to take those medications, um, and they can sign up for things to do as task lists. And then there are... Uh, participants and these people who are mainly involved in tasks and want to uh, maintain communication with the caregiver. So it gives you a flexible way to designate people with different uh, permissions. Here it gives you some examples of what it looks like um, and this is the uh, web uh, site once you log in. It shows you some of the different tasks that you can sign up to do. There's a due date, and then there's a check mark that shows whether it's been completed uh, or not. On the right, you see the medication list that our people are uh, currently on. And if you click on one of them, it'll give you more information on that, um, on that medication. And then once you come off that medication, you can make them inactive. Um, this is the mobile app, and we have an app for Android and one for iOS. You're able to see um, uh, the, the medications, when you're supposed to take them, you can add more medications, it can send you push notifications um, as well. Um, and you can get a summary of all those email, uh, all those medications. You can either print it uh, if you want to share it with your doctor or you can email it to someone. And this might actually help greatly in terms of medication reconciliation when you go to visit your doctor, especially when you have more than one provider and maybe you also have other medications that you've bought over the counter um, uh, through pharmacy. So um, InfoSage allows you to add herbals as well, herbal medications and over the counter medications. We have discovered that there's no one single type of family. Uh, there's all kinds of different structures and here you see uh, through color we've coded um, the different roles that people have, whether it's Keystone uh, or um, proxy or caregiver or participant. And so uh, the question is, is there one predominant type of structure? And the answer is, in our, in our experience, uh, there isn't one particular dominant. There's all kinds of different structure. And so I think we need to be able to allow uh, people to configure the system uh, and the roles as they see fit for their, their particular family. Here we see uh, one example of family that's connected. They're in different cities. And on the top left, you see sort of a distribution of activity. And you'll see that uh, after they register and they enter the medications, for the most part, there's a fairly low level of activity, maybe some tasks, 
that people do on a regular basis. Um, and then there are different spikes, and, and the spikes typically resolve, uh, usually occur when there's a change of medication or a change in clinical condition uh, that requires more activity to be uh, for people to be involved with. Um, and so, while the, the the usage, you know, is um, is not necessarily consistent, having the system set up and available allows you when there are uh, changes like that to rapidly be able to communicate that information and coordinate the care. One of the challenging things about InfoSage is that sometimes people don't think they need the system, and so they don't sign up. And then when something suddenly changes in their family, someone gets very sick, uh, and you need to do that, sometimes it's not easy at that time to get everyone signed up and um, uh, because everyone's sort of focused on the immediate emergency. So ideally, what we're trying to do is, what is the best time to introduce InfoSage to uh, families that have older adults or patients that might need this so that we can onboard them sooner and have the system available as their needs uh, progress? So that's an open area of question. What's the right engagement period uh, for enrolling people? Um, there are, uh, we did some studies on how people use the site, and here you see um, in blue, people that are non-keystones, so those are the family caregivers, and in red are the keystones. And we compared their usage uh, based on different types of functions, and, and you'll see that um, there was usage by both. Uh, the interesting thing is that the keystones were actually engaged on the site in terms, in terms of logging in and viewing their medications, entering medications, and inviting people. The family caregivers were more involved in things like tasks um, and um, and signing up to task and uh, and taking care of those tasks. We also looked at usage over time to see at what time there were. This shows you for all users approximately by intensity of color, what are the times that are most uh, busy. And you'll see that there's broad usage throughout the week. There's a few uh, higher areas of usage usually in the afternoon, so towards uh, later later evenings, but there is uh, consistent use uh, throughout most times of the, of the day. Uh, here you see a closer look at uh, the usage of different providers, and you'll see that over time, um, um, there are different episodic events that uh, increase the usage of it. Some families have more than one keystone, and they have um, uh, two, two older adults, uh, and they each uh, older adult may have overlapping caregivers. And so this shows you an example of that. Um, we deployed this here in Boston, um, and with our uh, patients here uh, at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. We also worked with senior centers, Hebrew Senior Life and LaSalle Village. Um, and one of them, Hebrew Senior Life, is uh, a higher medically intensive sort of uh, care facility that has both hospitals as well as um, nursing homes that have uh, medical staff uh, on site. And LaSalle Village has, uh, it's more of a residential and has some, um, some support in the hospital, but not as medically intense. And so both of them gave us insights into how to uh, deploy this. We also did a deployment in Taipei uh, and uh, in Taiwan with Taipei Medical University. And so we translated uh, the website to, uh, 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 to Chinese. And uh, we've also been exploring uh, an implementation of this in Colombia in Fundacion Valle del Lili in Cali, Colombia. And we've talked to different industry partners who have home visiting uh, nurse programs to see how this system can integrate uh, with their operations. And that's an ongoing discussion that we have with uh, uh, with those different groups. So what are some of the lessons learned? Well, we've learned that it is possible to create family care networks um, that are patient-centric uh, and that can have a broad range of people. We have found all kinds of different networks. Some of them have grandchildren that are involved in the care of their elders as well. Uh, and so this allows you to have a, a very flexible, uh, inclusive family support networks. It can include providers as well. And one of the challenges that we have had is uh, sort of what is the 
reimbursement model for the uh, engagement of care at home. And um, a lot of, at least in the U.S., a lot of the uh, funding is facility centric. The funding is changing to support more telehealth care work, and so that's a good thing for this. Um, but one of the issues that there is is sort of where does um, where does the care end from the organization, and when is the family involved, and how do you communicate between the family centric system like in Osage and the hospital based network? Um, and so sometimes hospitals are willing to receive patient collected data through mobile labs. Um, and so the question is, where does that, if you do want to transfer that data, how do you transfer that data and does it become part of the official medical record? So those work models are things that uh, are of high interest to us and, and both from an uh, outcomes and clinical care point of view, but also in how the data is exchanged. Um, both in terms of security, compliance, and other issues. So it gets complicated very quickly uh, in terms of trying to integrate this more, more tightly. Um, we have found that people have enrolled from all over the world for this uh, site. We primarily uh, have focused on uh, sharing information about this here in the New England area, but since we've opened it up to the world, uh, we've had people from around the world sign up to do this. We have found that um, Keystones are able to use this, and um, we have done usability studies, and through those, we've made improvements to the interface, so we've been able to have more usage by older adults. But there is definitely uh, a time in people's lives as we get older that both uh, because of uh, cognitive decline or physical decline or the complexity of technology that you won't be able to uh, fully utilize all the power of InfoSage. And so that's where the family caregivers and the proxies come in. This allows uh, to have a, a seamless support. And one of the areas that we're trying to study this more carefully is with uh, families that have dementia, uh, where they definitely need more involvement of, of families and other healthcare providers. Some of the things that we're doing new now is trying to connect uh, wireless devices that could collect biometrics. Uh, and can it communicate those to InfoSage. And, and here, it's not so much the issue of technology, but it's more about usability and human factors. Uh, could these devices be used consistently enough to provide uh, clinical grade data collection that would allow you to monitor when someone's symptoms are declining, and then how to appropriately alert the right person. You know, if it's not so severe, maybe it's a family member, it's a bit more uh, serious, maybe a home visiting nurse. If it's very serious, maybe the hospital with a, a red alert to take the person. So um, building uh, that, uh, that human factors evaluation in terms of how to collect data with these devices in a, with older adults um, is sort of an ongoing research area for us. Um, and uh, I guess bullet two is sort of how do you then uh, do this integration of this, and um, both with home visiting nurses and primary care uh, facilities. And so there's a whole workflow model and a reimbursement model that needs to be thought of. And so we've been talking to insurance companies and pharmacy companies, hospitals, uh, and families to try to think of that ecosystem. And one of the things we'd like to do is sort of invite people to sort of think of uh, a new model for both how the technology workflow and reimbursement should work for older uh, older adults. Finally, there's the opportunity as you collect a lot of data from uh, and with their consent, if you collect it securely and with their consent, you could aggregate a lot of data about uh, symptoms and drugs uh, that people are taking at home to be able to learn uh, potential side effects. And so one of the areas we're working on is drug-drug interaction alerts that could be tailored to older adults. And so most of the alerts that are there for drug-drug interaction alerts are not age specific. And I think if you had more data, um, you'd be able to create more specific alerts. And while there's lots of data at hospitals and medical records, there's a ton of data that we're not collecting from uh, patients at home, uh, symptoms that they're experiencing. Uh, and so I think a big opportunity is to use uh, home-based care to be able to collect that data and be able to develop um, better alerts to detect symptoms earlier, particularly adverse symptoms, 
and create the right alert. So I think there's a big opportunity. Uh, we've developed interfaces such as voice based interfaces for adding um, medications and inquiring about new medications. So we did our prototype Alexa. Um, there are some challenges there in terms of security of that data. This was a standalone system, not connected to the live system. Um, but I think voice is an important part of how we make some of these data collection easier for uh, patients at home. There's more and more clinical grade devices that the FDA is approving. And while that's all good that there's more of them, it's unclear which one of these uh, older adults would use in a regular basis to be able to do clinical monitoring. So how do you engage? And that's where the human factors comes in. And there's also more technologies that are coming in for just regular home monitoring for security. And there's a bunch of companies working in the space as well for home monitoring. So I think this is a growing area. Uh, it's ripe for innovation, integration, and business development. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this without a great team. I want to thank all the people here at the division that have worked with us. Here you see uh, some of the people both uh, past and current that have helped. And a particular uh, thank you to Charles Safran, who started this project, and Warner Slack, who uh, started the division with Howard Bleich and wrote some of the first patient-centric computing starting in 1967 and led, built some of the first telemedicine systems. Uh, Warner Slack had a famous saying that the most underutilized resource is the, in healthcare is the patient. And so based on that, we built in, uh, InfoSage to engage patients and families uh, to get them more involved in their, in their own care. So a lot of these systems require thorough evaluations, and I've shown you some of the things that we've done in terms of usage and uh, usability of the interface. Um, and as this grows, we need more rigorous ways to sort of evaluate uh, the user experience of this. Um, and so issues of patient satisfaction uh, become important. And so one of the things that we're particularly interested in is how to measure a patient experience and patient satisfaction. And we're delighted that we've started collaborations with the Veterans Administration in Puerto Rico, uh, who are also doing a lot of telemedicine in their area. And with uh, the group in Puerto Rico, we've been exploring approaches to more rigorously evaluate telemedicine to be serving. So I'm going to pass the floor over right now to uh, Dr. Mitch Eisenhower, uh, who is a, uh, uh, a doctor here at Beth Israel and joined our team earlier this year and has been instrumental in developing this along with Zoe Mia. So uh, Mitch, it's all yours. Great, thank you. Sorry, let me just get my screen set up for sharing over here. And everyone hopefully can see this. Um, and just so you know, one of our slides was prepared by um, one of the members of our um, laboratory Zoe Lab who couldn't be here today. So when we get to that slide, I'll give a signal and then there she has a pre-recorded um, piece that's gonna play during that time. So everyone can see my screen okay? Can I get a thumbs up, Yuri? All right, great. So we're gonna be talking about evaluation methods uh, for telemedicine. Um, So uh, currently we're working with the VA on evaluating the feasibility and acceptability of telehealth services caring for veterans with traumatic brain injury who are living in rural areas in the Caribbean and U.S. territories with Dr. Irma Molina, who's the principal investigator over there. Um, the research uh, is called Enhancing Access, a pilot study to evaluating traumatic brain injury. Uh, TBI assessment in rural areas of U.S. territories uh, using appropriate English and Spanish instruments via telehealth and veterans video connect interventions. We're currently trying to measure patient satisfaction with telehealth as a mode of traumatic brain injury care delivery uh, to identify target population size and acceptance rate for telehealth and to assess the reliability of Spanish and English telemedicine satisfaction surveys. Um, as part of this research, it's important to differentiate and define patient experience and patient satisfaction. While patient satisfaction and experience are often used interchangeably, they are not the same thing. Patient experience encompasses the range of interactions patients have with the healthcare system 
And to evaluate patient experience, you must determine if something which should happen in a healthcare setting actually happened with the frequency that it was uh, that it should happen. For example, did the patient receive clear communication, and did it happen at regular intervals? Satisfaction involves whether a patient's uh, expectations are met. In this case, it's possible for two patients who receive the same care to have different experiences because they have expected different things. Now, when it comes to evaluating patient satisfaction experience, it, a good tool to use is a survey. Uh, the benefit of surveys is that they're confidential, low cost, can evaluate metrics longitudinally and be systematically evaluated. However, their flaws are that they can inadequately consider their measured constructs, can lack validation, or not adhere well to survey guidelines. Uh, this is the slide that uh, Zoe's uh, pre-recorded thing is supposed to play on. Are we able to do that? Um, Olga. patient satisfaction and experience in telehealth in general. Um, we conducted a PubMed search using the terms for the VA and telemedicine. When we narrowed down these results to the past five years, there were 281 studies, and 46 of these studies evaluated telehealth visits for a particular disease state. The most common disease states that we saw were in mental health care, such as for PTSD, depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder, followed by diabetes, and then dermatology. 24 of these studies measured patient satisfaction and or experience as an outcome, and two specifically mentioned the use of the VA's Clinical Video Telehealth Survey, or CVT, and one mentioned the use of VA's Store and Forward Telehealth Survey, or SFT. The other studies used personalized questionnaires that were constructed for the purposes of the study itself. Great, uh, so pass back the screen. And let me get my webcam so back up right. All right. Perfect. So this is the clinical video telehealth or CBT survey. It's one of the surveys used to evaluate patient satisfaction and experience of the VA. It's a 12 question long English survey. It's based on a scale that goes from one to five and it covers domains such as usability, satisfaction with video and audio interface, therapeutic relationship, and care experience. However, we, we do recommend using a validated survey uh, to evaluate a telehealth service. So a validated survey is one in which it has had its questions evaluated for dependability, it's been shown to measure its intended constructs, and has been shown to consistently elicit the same results each time it was asked. So the steps that in, uh, to validate a survey involve establishing face validity of your constructs, performing pilot testing, completing your data set, performing a principal comp uh, components analysis, calculating Cronbox alpha, and then revising it as needed. This list of 12 validated surveys was compiled by Dr. Megan Weaver and is a systematic review of telehealth surveys. I wanted to go over a few of them that can be used to evaluate a telehealth service. One of the earliest validated surveys used for telemedicine was the technology acceptance model. It was developed in 1989 to predict user acceptance of computers. It was evaluated in a very uh, varied population, including postgrads, physicians, and teachers. And of note, this survey was designed primarily to evaluate user acceptance of technology, though that has changed significantly since 1989. The Telemedicine Satisfaction Usability Questionnaire was created for the IdeaTel project, which was a randomized controlled trial comparing telemedicine case management with usual care in older patients with diabetes in New York. It was validated in adults over, the, uh, over 55 with diabetes, the constructs it evaluated were perceived usefulness, effectiveness, ease of use, attitude, intention to use, and compared telemedicine to in-person care. Uh, a benefit of this was that it evaluated both communication modality and patient experience with communication and can be uh, found in Spanish as well. 
However, it was unidirectional, which means it only looked at the experience of a patient or family member. The telemedicine satisfaction questionnaire was built specifically to evaluate patient satisfaction and measures constructs such as satisfaction, technical quality, interpersonal manner, financial aspects, communication time, and accessibility and convenience. This one was validated in Chinese patients, uh, newly diagnosed uh, with diabetes from 40 to 70 years old. Um, something nice about this survey is that it's short. It covers the communication modality and has internal consistency that's very high. It's also available in Chinese. Um, but like most of the other surveys, it's unidirectional and it really only considers the patient point of view as opposed to those, uh, as opposed to also evaluating a care provider. The telemedicine perception questionnaire was developed to assess patients' impressions of the risks and benefits of home telecare. Uh, it was evaluated in an elderly assisted living and church community and evaluates uh, communication, privacy, confidentiality, time and cost savings, accessibility, uh, physical contact, trust and equipment, a few other factors. Um, unfortunately, this one is licensed and is available in English only. Uh, the telehealth usability questionnaire covers usability factors and combined questions, uh, combines questions from both the TSQ and TAM and PSSUQ. Um, the constructs covered herein are specifically associated with usability, such as ease of use and interface quality. Um, it is evaluated in patients and clinicians with and without telehealth experience. And something nice about this is that it's meant for both patients and clinicians, making it bi-directional with a heavy focus on usability. And finally, the patient assessment of communication during telemedicine survey, otherwise known as PACT, was focused on physician and pa physician to patient communication and was validated on outpatients at a VA hospital. Uh, of note, this survey is pretty long at 45 questions, and though, but it was validated by a randomized control uh, trial. Unfortunately, it also does not evaluate communication modality. So, Having gone over these possible surveys, let's talk about how to set up a study using your surveys. Um, firstly, you want to select your outcome of interest and determine your population of interest. Outcomes you may choose to measure are uh, things such as satisfaction, experience, technical quality, and usefulness. You can then evaluate your validated surveys for constructs which are uh, applicable to your outcomes of interest. Some examples here are method of care delivery or increased patient knowledge, empowerment, or access to care. Once you've evaluated your outcomes and curated a list of constructs you're interested in evaluating, you may move to selecting and potentially modifying a survey. Uh, we do recommend using a validated survey instrument if possible because it helps establish a set of accepted and well-validated instruments and assists the comparison of results across studies and supports a better integrated body of literature. We also recommend finding a survey that has the following criteria, such as using a validated instrument, matching the definition and conceptualization of chosen constructs, having good construct content and criteria on valid uh, validity, being reliable, having stable factor structure across studies, uh, being responsive to changes over time, and being designed and validated in a population similar to the one that you're studying. Other aspects you may consider are things such as readability, which is especially important as the concept should make sense within the population you're evaluating, length, which can affect the completion rate of your survey, sensitivity around difficult topics and clarity of topics, and consistency of the survey response choices. Now, if no survey is acceptable, or you, if you need to modify a validated survey to better fit your needs or population, we recommend piloting your survey and evaluating your instrument's validity and reliability. Um, so we recommend performing two pilot studies in a validation study if this is the route you choose to follow. So in pilot study number one, you assess the face validity and usefulness of your survey items, you remove poorly performing items, you ensure all your relevant constructs are assessed. In pilot study number two, you ensure your final version of the survey is working as intended. And then in the validation study, you use a large representative sample to establish construct, conversion, discrimination, and criteria and validity. Once you've done all that, you essentially produce a new validated study or a modified validated study. So then it's important to review your survey conducting and reporting. So it's important to choose a sampling frame and strategy of how you're going to perform your survey. Uh, choose the sample size that you believe is appropriate to your survey. Uh, 
choose the method that you're going to administer your survey with. Uh, consider strategies to improve response rate. For example, sometimes you know you, you pay survey takers. Uh, consider your data management procedures and ad analytical decisions, disclosures to your participants to make sure that they understand what they're filling out. Uh, and consider your participants' privacy. So in conclusion, there is a rising demand for healthcare due to changing demographics and increased need for chronic disease management. However, there are not enough healthcare providers to meet the needs of an aging population. So tools to coordinate and tools to coordinate uh, care are poor or non-existent. Patients and families are underused, and infrastage health families become more engaged and coordinated in their care plan. Uh, plan. Evaluations of InfoSage show that we can meaningfully engage with families, and using val validated surveys will be important to obtain objective measures of patient satisfaction and experience in the future. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mitch. Um, I see there's a couple of questions um, in the text area, so uh, perhaps I'll take the first few questions that they come in, Mitch, you can take uh, the next few. Uh, right. There are a couple of questions about um, um, the system integration and security for InfoSage. So the system uh, sits in a secure uh, HIPAA compliant environment with a uh, password encrypted uh, environment. Um, we are working towards doing a, a Firebase integration. Um, and that is particularly challenging because every medical record um, has different structures and so it requires individual mapping of data fields as well as sort of getting the agreements to, to be able to export data into InfoSage. The reverse is even more challenging as a lot of organizations aren't quite ready uh, to accept patient reporting. Uh, data. Uh, and so that's sort of an ongoing discussion we're having with different groups about how to handle that. But from a technical side, it's doable. We've started that technical program. Uh, the discussions will probably for um, um, in terms of where that data sits once it's received will be particularly challenging, I think. Um, not just for our project, but for all of telehealth. Um, the um, how do we handle situations with the vulnerable populations? Um, we are currently translating InfoSage to other languages. Uh, and so uh, we've, we've done Chinese, we're adding now uh, Spanish, Portuguese, and Creole, uh, and we're doing some usability testing from that. Um, dementia patients pose a particular challenge in that as they get more advanced in their disease, a lot of these technologies will be difficult, and that's where we think voice will be particularly um, important. In terms of symptoms, um, we're creating an environment where you'll be able to have different types of symptoms and choose which uh, types of symptoms you might want to collect from patients. Um, and so that will be a customizable environment and we're working with that. Um, and there are some standards for how to represent symptoms in a way that um, a data model that can be uh, more interchanged uh, I, I don't think there's been enough discussion of those data models. Um, and I think what would be helpful for the field is to have more standardization for symptom reporting uh, and how they're, what the schemas are, the database schemas to represent those so we can do better uh, data, data exchange among different uh, healthcare systems. And then I think the last question in there was, how do I get started uh, in um, this field? Um, and, you know, I think education and internships are a great way to, to get, um, and so Zoe Liao joined us as an intern. She's joined their research team and um, has publications now in informatics. Mitch is doing a, a master's uh, degree. There are fellowships. So I think combining both education and internships are really a great way uh, and just getting involved in, in projects. So there's lots, there's no one way, there's lots of different ways. Um, um, if you're interested in InfoSage, you can contact me. You see the email there, um, and we're happy to, to talk to you to see if you'd like to be able to, uh, to use, uh, use the, uh, the 
platform for your for your organization. And we're eager to have that discussion with different groups and share our knowledge. Uh, is there just is there a different chat window? I see a lot of questions from um, Gigi Yip uh, here. I don't know if there are any that are specifically about um, survey methodologies. A lot of them are about InfoSage. Okay. Hi, sorry, Mitchell. Um, all the questions at the bottom are um, from the attendees to you. Um, we're just collecting them for uh, you to answer them. Okay. Our work with the VA is to help um, uh, fill in gaps that are missing. One of the gaps that seems to be missing is how to do these surveys, particularly with vulnerable po populations with low literacy and low tech literacy um, um, and, um, and to see how these the patient experience is impacted based on people's social determinants of health. And so we're doing a lot of work to understand that space. We've got a few publications in social determinants of health and telehealth coming up. Um, and so while there's been some good body of work that Mitch has uh, done a very good job of summarizing what's already there, we think that there are definitely gaps in trying to understand people's patient experience from the point of view of their social determinants of health. And we're focusing on rural telemedicine with the VA, but uh, we're working here within our hospital to, uh, to understand the patient experience uh, for different types of populations. We're the second largest hospital system in the New England area. We're part of Beth Israel uh, Leahy. It's 13 hospitals in a broad range of socioeconomic um, populations. So if you're interested in what we're doing in that area, please uh, let us know. Thank you very much, Olga. Thank you, Mitch, Zoe, and our colleagues in the VA. Thank you.